today we're talking about the top 10 drivers who had extremely promising junior careers but flopped in their main careers. This is Triple Crown Racing, let's get into it. Some drivers have the absolutely most incredible junior careers. They have colourful resumes with race and championship wins in every feeder series under the sun. You'd think that these drivers are destined for success in top flight championships of open wheelers, sports cars, touring cars, you name it, but you'd be wrong. Some drivers, upon making the big leagues, flop flat on their faces and are forgotten. These are some of the drivers that had amazing junior careers but flopped in the big leagues. We'll start with some honourable mentions first. Nelson Piquet Jr. had quite the junior career. He won the Pseudo Americana Formula 3 Championship in 2002, placed third in British Formula 3 the following year, placed second in GP2 in 2006, and did nothing else noteworthy after that. He spent two lacklustre years in Formula 1 before not really doing anything for a few years in the NASCAR Truck Series and Nationwide Series. The only reason he's not on this list is because he's a Formula E champion. Pierre Gasly also had a great junior career, but after moving up from Toro Rosso to Red Bull, has since slumped. The reason he's not on this list is because his career has really only just begun. Pastor Maldonado won the GP2 Championship in 2010, as well as a couple of other championships in other series. However, in Formula 1, he crashed a ridiculous number of times, and the only reasons he is not on this list is because he is a Grand Prix winner and a Daytona 24-hour winner. And our final honourable mention was Dylan Kwasniewski. I actually learned about him from the NASCAR bus video by Black Flags Matter. Pick that name up. Now, technically, he didn't flop in a top flight series. He actually flopped in the Xfinity series, then the Nationwide series, after the most incredible junior career. He won both the K&N East and West series before an unimpressive season in Nationwide in 2014, and in 2015, the sponsorship money finally ran dry. Bosneski now works in real estate. Now, I know he didn't flop in a top flight series, but imagine performing so badly in motorsports that you basically become Phil Dumphy. Number 10, Tim Blanchard. Blanchard's early career was pretty promising. His car racing career began in 2005 in the Victorian Formula Ford Championship, in which he placed third that year. The following year, he placed fifth in Australian Formula Ford, and the year after that, he won the championship. He placed second in British Formula Ford in 2008, while trying his hand at tin tops in 2010. He placed second in the Fujitsu Supercars Championship in 2010, which is now Super 2, and fifth in 2011. He even won the Mike Cable Young Gun Award in 2010. Blanchard's junior career had gone really rather well. He entered full-time supercars competition in 2013, where things stopped going well. He joined DJR for his first full season, just as they entered a slump. He finished 26th in the standings that season. For 2014, he drove as an endurance driver for Lucas Dumbrell Motorsport, before returning to full-time competition for the team in 2015. He drove for Burtek Motorsport in 2016, and then his own team in 2017 and 2018. Over the years, he has jumped from seat to seat, however, none have yielded any results. He drives for Brad Jones occasionally, and he's also an endurance driver for the team. Since entering his first supercars race in 2010, he has finished in the top 10 a mere 5 times, and has a best point standings finish of 21st. His full-time career has come to a close, and Blanchard will unfortunately be remembered as a supercars bust who seemed so promising in his junior years. Number 9. J.R. Hildebrand 
JR Hildebrand is one of IndyCar's most unfortunate busts. Hildebrand's rookie career hit the ground running. He won the USF 2000 National Championship in his first ever season in 2006 by winning almost every race that season bar two. In his first full-time Atlantic campaign in 2007, he finished seventh in the championship, finishing behind drivers such as James Hinchcliffe, Jonathan Bomarito, and Robert Wickens. In 2008, he finished fifth in Indy Lights and actually won the championship the following year. He made his IndyCar debut in 2010 at Mid-Ohio with Dreyer and Reinbold. In 2011, he was entered into the full season by Panther Racing. And here's where it starts to go a bit wrong. Hildebrand had started the season off pretty well, and going into the Indianapolis 500, he'd just picked up a solid top 10 in Sao Paulo. But at the Indianapolis 500, he was leading the race on the final lap. But in turn 4, the final turn, he ploughed into the wall and Dan Weldon overtook him on the start finish straight while his destroyed car rolled over the line in second. Honestly, this hurts writing this, and it wasn't even me. It's actually cringeworthy, and the horrendous irony of this is that it was his joint best IndyCar finish. Hildebrand was fired from Panther in 2013 after finishing dead last at the Indianapolis 500. He drove two more races in 2013 with Barracuda before racing at Indy in 2014 with Ed Carpenter and CFH in both races at Indy in 2015. His last full-time, except Alabama, season came with Ed Carpenter in 2017 with a best finish of second at Iowa. Since then, he has only raced at Indianapolis twice, both with Dreyer and Reinbold, with the best finishes of those two races being 11th. Since beginning his IndyCar career, he has picked up three podiums but no wins, and has a best point standings finish of 11th. The story of J.R. Hildebrand may be one of the saddest stories on the list. He was literally one corner away from greatness, but threw it all away. Number 8. Sage Karam Sage Karam's junior career is actually very similar to that of J.R. Hildebrand's. He made his racing debut in the US F2000 Championship in 2010, and won it by winning nearly every race. In 2011, he made his Star Mazda debut. He drove full-time in the series in 2012, finishing third in the championship by taking three wins and ten podiums. In 2013, he spent a year in Indy Lights and won the championship. Karen made his IndyCar debut in 2014 at the Indianapolis 500, where he finished an impressive ninth place, which would have been good enough for Indy 500 Rookie of the Year, had it not been for Kurt Busch. Karam joined Chip Ganassi in 2015 on a part-time schedule, sharing the duties of the number 8 with Sebastian Saavedra. The results were mixed. He only finished in the top 10 twice, however those two finishes were a 5th place and a 3rd place. Unfortunately, during the Pocono 500, Karam was leading the field with 21 laps remaining, before he lost control and hit the barrier. Not only had he just thrown away the win, but debris flew off his car and hit Justin Wilson ending his life. Karam lost the drive at Ganassi after the end of the season, and was replaced by Max Chilton. Since 2016, Karam has been on a one-race deal with Dreyer and Reinbold to race at the Indianapolis 500. However, this season he did get the opportunity to race with Carlin in Toronto and at Iowa. While Karam's junior career was almost as good as it gets, his career in IndyCar has been somewhat fruitless. However, if Karam can eventually land a full-time ride, maybe at Carlin, he might not be on this list in a few years' time. Number 7. Satoru Nakajima Satoru Nakajima began his career in the Japanese Top Formula Championship, also known as All Japan Formula 2, in 1977. Now, in case you don't know, Japanese Top Formula went on to become Japanese Super Formula. Now, whether or not Super Formula is a development series is debatable. On the one hand, Pierre Gasly competed in it before making the jump to Formula 1 as part of the Red Bull development program, but on the other hand, drivers like Naoki Yamamoto have made careers out of the series. For instance, we'll count it as part of his junior career. Nakajima was unbelievably successful in Japanese top formula, winning the championship five times and taking 21 wins between 1977 and 1986, making him one of the most successful drivers in the history of the series. Unfortunately, Nakajima won't be remembered for his fantastic top formula success, but rather his success, or rather lack thereof, in Formula 1. 
Nakajima joined Lotus for the 1987 season. Nakajima was put into a situation nobody wants to be in. His teammate was none other than Ayrton Senna. Senna finished third in the championship that season, taking two wins and eight podiums in the process. Senna racked up 57 points that season. Nakajima, on the other hand, finished 12th in the championship with 7 points. Now, back in 1987, only the top 6 scored points. Considering the fact that Nakajima was driving a race-winning car, the fact that he only finished in the points on 3 occasions out of 16 races, it's, it's disappointing to say the least. 1988 was even worse for Nakajima as he finished 16th in the points and failed to qualify twice and in doing so became the only driver ever to fail to qualify in a Honda V6 during the Turbo V6 era of the 80s. 1989, despite scoring two more points than he did in 88, so three, was actually even worse. Nakajima finished 21st in the championship while Nelson Piquet finished 8th. Both of the Lotus teammates did pretty terribly that season because Lotus had actually switched to Judd's power plants. 1990 was slightly better for Nakajima as he moved to Tyrrell and finished 15th in the standings and in 1991 he finished 15th again. However, 91 would unfortunately be his final season in Formula 1 and he would end his career with 0 wins, 0 podiums and 16 points to his name. Nakajima entered Formula 1 at the age of 34, which is way too old to be entering Formula 1. It's a shame he didn't just stay in top Formula and go down as a legend of the sport, not an F1 bust. Number 6, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. made his ARCA Series debut for what would be his only season in 2008 and he hit the ground running. Stenhouse finished 4th in the standings that year, and he actually picked up 2 wins and 8 top 5s along the way. He made his Xfinity Series debut in 2009, starting a few races for Roush Fenway. In 2010, he completed almost the full season, and finished 16th in the championship with 3 top 5s. It got even better for Stenhouse in 2011, and from there he won the championship 2 years on the trot, taking 8 wins across those 2 years in the process. Unfortunately, the Cup Series was the beginning of the end for Stenhouse. For the 2013, Stenhouse began driving for Roush Fenway. While both of his teammates made the chase with race wins, Stenhouse finished a lowly 19th. Since first racing in the Cup Series for the first time in 2012, Stenhouse has picked up only two race wins and has a best finish in the standings of 13th. Over the years, he has been christened with the nickname Recky Stenhouse for his tendencies to be rather accident prone. This year, it was announced that Stenhouse would be dropped by the team, and at the time of writing this, it appears he has no future prospects in the Cup Series. Stenhouse had quite a promising junior career with his two Xfinity titles, and was given a great opportunity with a car that was capable of winning races. Unfortunately, he flopped in the Cup Series. Number 5, Richie Stanaway. Richie Stanaway has just kind of been all over the place. Stanaway began his racing career in Formula First back in 2007. He would place third in the New Zealand Formula First Championship in the 2007 and 8 season, third in the Formula Ford Manfield Winter Series in 2008, and in the 2008-09 New Zealand Formula Ford season, he'd take home the championship. In 2010, he'd win the ADAC Formal Masters Championship. In 2011, he won the German Formula 3 Championship. He even took a couple of wins in GP3 and GP2 in 2011, 2014 and 2015. After this, it's sort of an unsuccessful mess. Stanaway has raced in 5 seasons of the WEC, but never really full time. He's picked up a couple of wins and a couple of podiums with Aston Martin, both in GTE Am and Pro, but his best career championship standings was 7th. He made his supercars debut in 2016, driving in the endurance races. 
he actually won the Sandown 500 and took a podium at the Gold Coast 600. But after that, in 2018, he contested the full season and finished 25th in the standings in a Tickford car. He's done a few races in 2019 with Gary Rogers, but really hasn't been that impressive. While Stanaway might not be so much as a bust as some of the other people on this list, he seems to have just been underwhelming in almost every series since the end of his junior career. Number 4, Roman Grosjean. Oh boy, now it's getting interesting. Roman Grosjean began his car racing career in 2003 and actually won the championship in his first season of Formula Lister 1.6 Junior. In 2005, he won French Formula Renault, in 2007, he won the Formula 3 Euro Series, and in 2008, he won the GP2 Asia Series. In 2010, he won the Auto GP Championship, and in 2011, he won both the GP2 Championship and the GP2 Asia Series. By the time 2012 rolled around, he'd won seven championships throughout the course of his junior career. However, in 2012, he joined Lotus in Formula One for what was the most mixed rookie season ever. Grosjean had actually contested a few races in the 2009 season with Renault, and he actually hadn't done too bad. So what could go wrong for 2012? At the Australian Grand Prix, Grosjean made contact with Pastor Maldonado, causing his steering arm to break. At the Malaysian Grand Prix, he spun off and retired. At the Monaco Grand Prix, he crashed out on the first lap. And then at the Belgium Grand Prix, he did this and got himself a race ban. At the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, he crashed out again. And at the Brazilian Grand Prix, he would crash out one last time to end the 2012 season. The only reason I say this was mixed was because he actually managed to pick up three podiums and finished eighth in the standings. However, his teammate Kimi Raikkonen finished third in the standings that year with a race win in Abu Dhabi. You have permission to say Bois now. 2013 would pretty much be the same. He picked up a few podiums, crashed a few times, and finished seventh that year. However, Kimi Raikkonen finished fifth in the standings with another race win in Australia, so success is relative, I guess. 2014 was pretty terrible for Grosjean, as he suffered a lot of mechanical failures and finished 14th in the standings. 2015 was a little bit better, and he finished 11th in the standings with a podium at the Belgium Grand Prix. After Lotus went bust, Grosjean went to newcomer Haas for the 2016 season, and ever since then it's kind of just been downhill. In 2019 he's currently 17th in the standings, and he's nearly been fired several times since joining Haas for either underperforming, crashing, or crashing into his teammates. Something tells me Grosjean won't be in F1 for too much longer, which kind of sucks because in the early part of his career he looked very promising. Because of the podiums he scored, he's only 4th on this list, which is less than can be said for the top 3 on this list. Number 3, Stoffel Van Dorn. Van Dorn had a pretty impressive junior career. He began his car racing career in 2010 and actually won in his first season of F4 Euro Cup. In 2012, he won the Formula Renault 2 litre Euro Cup. He placed second in the 2013 season of Formula Renault 3.5, losing only to Kevin Magnussen. And in 2015, he won the GP2 series by not only beating Alexander Rossi, but destroying him, scoring nearly double his points. So, naturally, someone that good makes it to Formula 1, and in 2016, he finished 10th while filling in for Fernando Alonso at the Bahrain Grand Prix. So far, Van Dorn's career had been absolutely unbelievable, and in 2017, he inherited the seat that had been vacated by Jensen Button. Unfortunately, when Van Dorn entered Formula 1, he'd come into McLaren's worst era in Formula 1 since the mid to late 60s. McLaren had been struggling with the Honda power plant for two years at this point. McLaren was a shadow of its former self and hadn't, and still hasn't, won a race in years. Van Dorn only got to spend two seasons in Formula 1 in both of which he was outperformed by his much more experienced teammate, Fernando Alonso. 
Van Dorn finished both of his years in Formula 1 in 16th in the standings, scoring a combined points tally of 25. After he was replaced at McLaren, Van Dorn tried his hand at Formula E, where he did pretty much just as poorly in the 2018-19 season with HWA Race Lab, finishing 16th in the standings, last of the full-timers. In 2019, he did finish on the podium at the 24 Hours of Le Mans with SMP, and things might be looking up for Van Dorn. For the 2019-20 season, he'll be driving on the Mercedes factory team in Formula E. Finally, things might be looking up for good old Stoffel, but so far, since his junior career, it's been a bit of a flop. Number 2, Antonio Giovinazzi. Antonio Giovinazzi is a driver who I believe is on the wrong career path. Despite this, he seems adamant on pursuing it. Giovinazzi started off his car racing career back in 2012, winning the Formula Pilota Championship in his first season. In 2013, he placed second in British Formula 3. In 2015, he placed second in European Formula 3 and win the Masters of Formula 3. He first dipped his toes into sports car racing in the 2015-16 season of the Asian Le Mans series, finishing third in the championship in LMP2. In 2016, he finished second in GP2, while also racing a few times the European Le Mans series and the WEC with SMP and ESM respectively. He actually picked up a podium at the Six Hours of Shanghai that year. While his junior career was pretty good and he has a couple of prospects in sports cars, his F1 career really hasn't been that great. Giovinazzi started his first F1 race back in 2017, doing two races to fill in for Pascal Wehrlein. He finished 12th at the Australian Grand Prix, but crashed out of the Chinese Grand Prix. In 2018, he'd start only a single race, being the 24 Hours of Le Mans. That year, he finished 5th with AF Corsa and GTE Pro. For the rest of the year, he acted as a test driver for Haas and Ferrari. He was due to contest that year's Petit Le Mans with ESM, but duty called at Sauber and he had to postpone. Giovinazzi joined Alfa Romeo for the 2019 season and so far, he has been fairly disappointing. So far, as of the Japanese Grand Prix, Giovinazzi has scored 4 points. Meanwhile, Kimi Raikkonen has scored 31 points. You have permission to say boah. To be fair, it's probably not a great situation to have Kimi Raikkonen as a teammate, as proven by Roman Grosjean. But in a car that's clearly capable of scoring points regularly, Giovinazzi's performance has been pretty underwhelming so far. Still, his career in Formula 1 has only just begun and personally I think he could have some pretty promising opportunities in sports cars, but so far his Formula 1 career has been pretty disappointing. And now, it's time for number one, the driver with an impressive junior career and the most disappointing main career is... Jolian Palmer! Jolian Palmer is the son of successful businessman and XF1 driver Jonathan Palmer. Young Jolian began his car racing career in 2005 in the T-Cars Autumn Trophy, finishing fifth in the standings that year. The following year, he joined his father's team and won the Autumn Trophy and placed fifth in the main championship. In 2008, he placed third in the Formula Palmer Audi Championship. In 2010, he placed second in Formula 2. He spent three years in GP2 between the years of 2011 and the end of 2014. He won the championship in 2014 with Dams. Palmer was deemed ready for the big leagues after spending a year as a test driver for Lotus. He joined the newly formed Renault team for 2016. It wasn't the best year for either Palmer or his teammate Kevin Magnussen. Palmer finished 18th in the championship. He placed second last in the standings of the full-time drivers, placing only ahead of Pascal Wehrlein on equal points. He finished in the top 10 only once that year. Kevin Magnussen left Renault for 2017, and Palmer was paired with Nico Hülkenberg. While Hülkenberg finished strongly, placing in the points on numerous occasions and ended 10th in the standings that year, Palmer finished 18th with only a 6th place finish to his name. 
Palmer performed so poorly in relation to his teammate, he was booted from the team after the Japanese Grand Prix in favour of Carlos Sainz Jr. At the age of 28, Jolien Palmer's racing career is over. There were talks of him moving to Super GT, but that never came to fruition. Like everyone on this list, Palmer had an incredibly promising junior career, but unlike everybody else on this list, he didn't achieve the same amount of points in a Renault as Robert Kubica did in that garbage barge of a Williams he's driving this season. And that's gonna do it for this top 10 list. I hope you've enjoyed. Tell me if I should do more, and if so, what about? Are there any you disagree with? Are there any that should have been added? Do you have any different orders in which you think the list should have been in? Tell me in the comments below. Anyway, that's it from me. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.